Good morning and welcome to the 29th meeting of the Public Audit and Post-Legislative Scrutiny Committee in 2018. Can I ask everyone in the public galleries to please switch off their electronic devices or turn them on to silent mode? Item 1 is decision on taking business in private. Do members agree to take item 3 in private this morning? Agreed. Thank you. Item 2 is section 22 report, the 1718 audit of NHS Tayside. I'd like to welcome our witnesses to the meeting this morning, Caroline Gardner, Auditor General for Scotland, Fiona Mitchell-Knight, Audit Director, Lee Johnson, Senior Manager, Performance and Best Value, and Bruce Crosby, Senior Audit Manager of Audit Scotland. I'd like to now invite the Auditor General to make a brief opening statement. Thank you, Convener. This is the fourth consecutive report I've provided to Parliament on NHS Tayside, highlighting a series of significant concerns in financial performance and governance issues. Today's report sets out NHS Tayside's worsening financial position and the increasing challenges it faces in meeting its financial and performance targets. It provides an update on events over the last financial year, including arrangements for the departure of the former Chief Executive. The external auditor gave an unqualified opinion on the 2017-18 accounts. This means the accounts provide a true and fair view of the board's financial position and there are no significant errors. However, she does highlight several areas of concern. For the last six years, the board has required brokerage from the Scottish Government to achieve financial balance. The board has a total of £45.9 million outstanding brokerage and further brokerage will be required. In June, the Board approved a one-year financial plan for 2018-19, which identifies a potential deficit of £18.7 million for the year. The Board's financial position has been compounded by the mismanagement of e-health funding and endowment fund monies in previous years. The Cabinet Secretary for Health and Support announced in October that the Scottish Government will not seek repayment of brokerage accumulated up to 31 March 2019 from territorial NHS boards. While this provides NHS Tayside with some breathing space, it doesn't address the under underlying financial challenges facing the board. I've highlighted in previous reports NHS Tayside's expensive operating model compared to other boards. This is a main factor in the financial challenges it has faced over the years. NHS Tayside recognises this, and its transformation programme will be key to reducing the cost base. By June 2018, there was still limited evidence of sustainable service redesign and transformation. The Board achieved efficiency savings of £46.8 million in 2017-18, but only 36% of this was recurring, and its net expenditure increased from previous years. The new senior management team has reviewed NHS Tayside's approach to transformation and developed plans through a, con through a combination of long-term strategic measures and short-term efficiencies. The Independent Assurance and Advisory Group set up by the Scottish Government was due to provide a progress report on NHS Tayside's transformation programme in November, which I understand the committee received overnight and will review this in due course. Several senior staff have left the board over the last year and an interim chief executive and chair and a new director of finance took up post in 2018. The auditor reviewed arrangements relating to the departure of the former chief executive and identified several errors in the process and a lack of good governance. The appointment of a new chief executive was announced on the 28th of November and a recruitment exercise is now underway to appoint a new chair before the end of the financial year. In conclusion, NHS Tayside urgently needs to set out the detail of how it intends to achieve financial sustainability. In particular, it needs effective and stable leadership to drive forward its plans for transformation. As always, Convener, we'll do our best to answer the Committee's questions. Thank you very much, Auditor-General, and thank you for your report. I'm going to open questioning for the Committee this morning, but before I do that, I'd like to make a couple of brief observations. The first is on the Assurance and Transformation Group report, which you referred to in your opening statement. The Committee did receive uh, the third report, Sir Lewis Ritchie's report, but only at six o'clock last night. This is not the first time that this has happened, that the Scottish Government have sent uh, papers to this audit committee at the 11th hour. It does not give committee members, nor indeed your team at Audit Scotland, time to, uh, to review these papers in any meaningful sense. And I would put on record that I think it's quite disrespectful of the, the Scottish Government to, to provide information to Parliament in this way. Um, and I hope they take note of that. The um, second point I wanted to observe is the um, Oscar 
statutory inquiry, which of course covers the issue of the transfer of money from the Charitable Endowment Fund, NHS Tayside, to core funding. Oscar have a statutory responsibility to investigate um, what's going on. They were due to report on the 30th of November. Um, we now understand, after a bit of prompting, that they may report in January. But frankly, I feel this has taken far too long, at least six months now, to come to any conclusions and come to their first report. So we await, we eagerly um, anticipate that report to see uh, what it says. Can I ask you, Auditor General, of course, um, my primary concern for NHS Tayside is the care of patients right across Tayside. And the figures you provide um, at the end of your report, I think NHS Tayside only meets seven out of the 20 government standards. Can you give us a bit more of your uh, reaction to that, please? I think the first thing to say is that the um, leadership at NHS Tayside are very much focused on uh, doing what they can to protect and indeed improve um, the quality of care for patients across Tayside. Uh, but you're right, um, I've reported that performance declined this year. I think in 2016-17, the board achieved nine of the national performance standards. Um, in 2017-18, that had reduced to seven of them, and we set that out in the appendix. It is worth noting, though, that NHS Tayside is probably still slightly above the average for health boards across Scotland. Um, and I reported in my national report in October that performance is declined nationally, so they're not alone in that. Some of them particularly worry, including mental health for children and the waiting times, but I know that one of my colleagues is going to address that. Can I turn your attention, Auditor General, to the issue of severance pay for the, uh, the previous uh, temp um, permanent chief executive of NHS Tayside? Um, your report details several uh, anomalies on the arrangements of severance pay. I think the standout one for me is the fact that the previous chief executive was paid um, six months in lieu of notice rather than three, which was in her contract. Is that, is that a legal payment? Is that correct? Is that... Your, um, referring to paragraphs 41 onwards of my report, where we try to set out what happened in what was clearly quite a confused process. I think it's important to start off by saying that I concluded that the decision to negotiate a settlement with the chief executive to bring about her departure was a reasonable decision. Um, at that point, the board took appropriate legal, device about, legal advice about the options open to it um, and the risks of... Um, that becoming quite a protracted process. Uh, so I'm content that the decision to negotiate a settlement was reasonable. Um, the, yeah. uh, there was real confusion, I think, in the uh, advice given to the uh, former, to the acting chief executive and chair about the notice period, which was relevant to the former chief executive. Um, her contract clearly stated that she was on three months' notice. The assistant chief executive and strategic director of workshop workforce believed that um, other chief executives across Scotland were on six months' notice, and that in order to treat her fairly and with parity with other chief executives, six months should be applied. Um, the process by which the contract um, was actually uh, updated to reflect that didn't meet good governance. It wasn't considered by the Remuneration Committee until November of this year. Um, and the um, Assistant Chief Executive wasn't able to provide the auditor with evidence for why she believed that the contract period should be six months rather than three months. So there's no doubt there was confusion about that element of the settlement. You said that the um, Interim Chief Executive was advised on the six-month period. Who, who did that advice come from? Uh, my report um, identifies that the person providing advice to the interim chief executive and the interim chair was the uh, assistant chief executive and strategic director of workforce. That's a full title for one person within NHS Tayside. Within NHS yes. Tayside. And was government consulted on this at any point? Yes, NHS Tayside consulted both the um, Scottish Government's Health and Social Care Workforce Directorate and the Central Legal Office. But they would have had a better overview of the three-month, six-month contractual settlement right across Scotland than somebody in NHS Tayside, because it's their job to have an overview. Were they not able to provide that information? Um, I think confusion arose between what the contractual entitlement was for the... Um, 
former chief executive at NHS Tayside and what was being negotiated as part of a settlement. Um, I make the point in my report that the business case that was submitted for approval to Scottish Government didn't make reference to the three-month notice period. Um, and I think there, there is confusion, as I say, which is not um, reflecting good governance in the way this was handled. I mean, Officer General, you know as well as I do that the finances of NHS Tayside have been of extreme concern to both this committee and to you for a number of years now, but especially to people in in Tayside. And I think people were shocked that the outgoing chief executive would be paid, and it now transpires from your report, more than the contractual entitlement. I received a letter from John Brown, the chairman of NHS Tayside, um, on the 7th of August this year, and he states in that letter, all payments are legal and contractual entitlements and no additional payments have or will be made by NHS Tayside. Given your report, is that an accurate statement? At the point um, where the settlement was agreed, right up to the point of settlement, the contractual entitlement was three months' notice rather than six months' notice. As I've said, I think that the um, decision to negotiate a settlement was a reasonable one, and what figure may have come out of that settlement separately from the notice period is an open question. But I have no doubt that the contractual period for the former chief executive was three months. OK. So the... The, pay, the period of six months payment in lieu of notice was not a contractual entitlement. The Remuneration Committee only agreed a change to the Chief Executive's contract retrospectively in November, November. of this year. So as of 7th of August, that was not um, That's right. an accurate statement. OK, Alex Neil. Auditor General, would you regard it as good practice to change the term of a contract once the person has submitted the resignation? Um, in this case, it was um, changed formally after the former chief executive had, had left the board. That happened at the end of July this year. Um, I do want to be clear. I, I think, um, having concluded that negotiating a settlement was reasonable, I think, given the um, balance of risks facing the board, to have agreed a settlement period of six months would not have been unreasonable had there been a proper audit trail for doing that. But that audit trail doesn't exist, and there was a confusion about why the notice period was increased to six months. But there are not two separate months. things here. I mean, I, I have never heard, either in the private sector or in the public sector, where a contract of employment is changed once you've left that employment and where the period of notice is doubled after, after you've left the employment. That surely cannot be good practice. I, I think I'm agreeing with you, Mr Neil. My, the, the, um, the rationale of the contract period um, being six months rather than three really clearly doesn't right. stand up. That's not to say there could not have been grounds for negotiating a settlement payment of six months. You notice. describe it as confusion, but we're talking here about the director of the workforce, who's supposed to be the person who is the professional in relation to contracts of employment, etc. So it's not just confusion, it's total incompetence. If he changes the period of the contract and doesn't even check, because the reason apparently he gave for that was that it was to bring into line, uh, albeit after the chief executive had left the organisation, to bring it into line with other chief executives in the network of territorial boards. He clearly hadn't even checked whether that was factually correct or not. That's incompetence. That's not just confusion. As you would expect, um, Fiona and her team as the auditors probed this quite um, deeply as part of their audit work. Um, I'll give you a bit more background if that would be useful. Um, we reference in my report um, at the foot of page 13 the extant circular, which dates back to 2006, which is very clear that um, chief executives' notice periods should be between three and six months um, and that any change requires to be authorised by the remuneration committee. So the, the guidance itself is very clear. There apparently um, has been at some point a draft circular in circulation um, to which the Assistant Chief Executive Strategic Director of Workforce referred, um, which proposed some changes to that but which was never finalised and enacted. 
Um, and the uh, Assistant Chief Executive advised us that she understood that other Chief Execs of Territorial Health Boards had a six-month notice period and therefore that there was a danger that the Board um, could be found to have been uh, discriminating against the former che Chief Executive at Tayside. Since then, as we say in the report, um, through audit work we've discovered that three of the Territorial Health Board Chief Executives do in fact have a notice period of three months. So there is confusion about this. Um, I can't speculate about the source of that confusion, but you're right. This is the sort of good governance that I would expect to see about a decision of this seriousness. But, but, but let's be clear, there are three documents. There's a document from 2006 that says there has to be a period of between three and six months. Her contract of the chief executive was consistent with that because her contract said three months. Then there was a draft circular, but everybody knows it's a draft circular, not been implemented, not agreed, not policy, and yet the director of the workforce and the assistant chief executive, the same person, ignores that. And then, thirdly, doesn't even check her facts, or, as it, which is the basis of making this decision. That is pure incompetence from a director of a workforce. I don't think I can add more to what's in my... Uh, report, Mr Neil. The, the, the facts as you've described them are correct and are as we've set out in, in the report. Um, I think there was a, um, a genuine and legitimate desire to bring the situation to a close and this was um, poor governance that was not based on good advice about the provisions that governed the Chief Executive's notice period. Is it not time we introduce some sanctions for, for such poor governance? Because you know the poor taxpayer is picking up the tab every time for this and they are fed up to the back teeth with people in film star salaries getting film star severance payments, and particularly where it would appear they're not even entitled to it based on the period of contract they had. I entirely understand yours and the committee's frustration about it, and I think it's a question that the committee may wish to take up with government. OK, thank you. Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mayor. Um, Auditor General, I, <clears throat> I've kind of lost count of the number of times that we've talked about governance. Uh, in the public sector in general, and before I go, you know, into the particular NHS one here, we've seen it in colleges, we've seen it in NHS. We, it just seems constantly we're finding problems with the quality of governance in terms of uh, public sector bodies. Is there any sign of improvement? Is there any sign that it's been recognised and that uh, something is being done? to get better quality or better informed, better trained people to, get, to take part in boards across the public sector? I think it's important for me to start by saying that by definition the things that I report to this committee tend to be the instances where things have gone wrong. Um, I audit 200 bodies across Scotland um, and you don't hear about most of them because things are being managed well. That's, it. That's an important starting point. Um, I think government does take very seriously the importance of good government, uh, good governance in um, making the best use of public money and engendering uh, public confidence in the way public money is spent. Um, I think we've seen uh, moves to improve the public appointments process, um, tightening to the guidance around um, um, uh, severance agreements and you've heard some of that before about the need now for government to approve those packages before they actually take effect um, and clearly in situations like this particularly when people are under pressure things go wrong my role is to report that to you I think you may want to explore with government the action they're taking to reduce the chances of it happening in future you correctly say that uh, you know the reports that come forward to us tend to be the bad news the good news is uh, forever hidden but consistently throughout this bad news you bring us there are strong elements of problems with governance which frequently exacerbate and sometimes cause the problems is there is, is there a pattern I, I i think the only pattern that I can draw to your attention, apart from things occasionally going wrong in individual bodies, is that when bodies or sectors are under particular pressure, things are more likely to go awry. 
Um, as the committee knows, I've been reporting on the growing financial pressures on the NHS since I've been in this role um, and on my concern that often the measures being taken to address those pressures are the short-term measures rather than addressing the underlying challenges, focusing on meeting um, individual year-end targets rather than whether a, whether a board is financially sustainable. Um, you mentioned FE colleges. I think there were particular risks in FE colleges at the time of um, reorganisation and reform in that sector when we saw a number of things going wrong. Um, I think it would be unfair to assume that the quality of governance is poor across public services, but we have reported about the risks that arise at periods of particular pressure or of significant change, and we continue to look out for that through our audit work. Turning to NHS Tayside, um, we've obviously had this before us as a committee for now for several years, and we've been given assurances periodically that things are starting to improve. Clearly from your report, that doesn't seem to be the case and that progress has been poor. And what alarms me is that the new chief executive on, on page four, paragraph four, says that after considering the governance framework and assurances from the board's committees, he's not able to conclude that corporate governance was operating effectively in 2017-18, which is obviously the period up to when he took over. Is that really the case? Has there been no real, no substantive improvement in the in the governance quality? I mean, the new if the new chief executive uh, says that he's unable to say that governance is operating effectively, that's quite damning. I think it's important to be clear that the interim chief executive was making that assessment shortly after he'd arrived at the health board, which I think was in April 2018, and as part of the normal process of completing the annual report and accounts for the board um, and of the audit um, process reaching a conclusion on that. Um, I think we have seen some improvements um, in governance referred to um, in the report in relation to things like, for example, the financial reporting to the board is better than it has been in the past. Um, and we are not at all discounting the fact that significant work has been going on to produce the transformation strategy, um, the quality improvement programme and the um, short-term efficiency measures that the board is relying on. Um, the wording in my report is quite careful um, that there is so far little evidence of the sustainable change that's needed to bring the board into a financially sustainable position for the future. As the convener said, the, the NHS Tayside Assurance and Advisory Group report came in very late mm -hmm. in, the, in the proceedings here, and frankly, I haven't had an opportunity to go through it in depth. One thing which did come out to me, though, was that the, the chairman on page five of the report that says that the chairman presented a report to the board in October on an independent assessment of board governance. Have you had sight of that document? Uh, Fiona and Bruce will have done as, as the auditors to NHS Tayside, and I'll ask them to um, talk you through their involvement in that so far. Because clearly I think this committee might have an interest in, in seeing that as well. Yes, uh, yes, um, yes. So certainly as part of the audit, we were provided with a, a copy of that report that went to the um, board in October. And what that summarised was the, the governance issues that were had been identified to date. And... Um, uh, lays out some initial plans and improvement actions that the board intends to take in the future. Some of those have already been progressed and are mentioned in the Section 22 report, as the Auditor General referred to, in terms of improvements in the financial reporting and um, how the budgets have been based. But obviously it's very early days and since October, um, you know, we haven't seen the implications of, of those improvement actions yet, but we will be looking at that as part of this year's audit and we'll report in next year's annual audit report. I mean, quite clearly we're, we're kind of in a situation that we were previously, which is we've got a new team coming in with the new chair and new chief executive. But in your report on page 5, paragraph 13, you say the board continues to face leadership challenges. Are these leadership challenges going to be addressed by, by putting in place the new chair and the new chief executive? Are there broader issues with the composition of the board itself and the skills and experience that they've got? I think my starting point is that 
as you say, we're still in a period of change, that the um, newly appointed chief executive is due to take up his post early in 2019. The Scottish Government is currently recruiting a new permanent chair to the board, so those two people aren't yet in place. One of them isn't yet identified. Um, and I think um, Fiona would agree that there are signs of pressure on the leadership team at NHS Tayside, as you would expect in a situation as challenging as this and with as much um, instability and turnover as there has been. Um, I think one of the things that I'm interested in is the level of support which government is able to provide to boards in these circumstances, um, making sure that not only is support available, but that, it, that it's uh, joined up, focused on the right issues and focused on the longer term rather than on uh, short term measures, what's really needed to, to bring sustainability um, against the picture of the overall pressures facing health and care in Scotland. Is the level of Scottish government support there adequate, do you think, or are there other things they could be doing? Um, it, it's hard to draw an overall conclusion about it, I think. There certainly is support in place. Um, the Assurance and Advisory Group is part of that. Um, there has been consultancy support, as you know, um, uh, put in and paid for by the Scottish Government. Um, I think it's, my concern is less about the volume of support, but about making sure that it's focused on the right things and that it really is joined up and consistent to help people um, tackle what are genuinely difficult circumstances in this board and in other boards across Scotland. Liam Kerr. Thank you, convener. I'd like to pick up on the chief executive payout, uh, if I may. You, you talked in brief there of a business case having been prepared. Uh, can this committee see that business case? We um, I certainly have, have a copy of that business case. Um, I don't know what the, the normal protocol is for us providing. General. I'm, I'm sure you can have a, a copy of it. You may want to request it from the board, but we have a copy if, if that's a more direct or quicker way for you to get hold of it. I think that would be very helpful. Um, you mentioned, Auditor General, that legal advice was taken at some point in this process. Can you tell me when competent legal advice was first taken? Was it before the extension of the notice period? Um, it was during the negotiation of the settlement agreement with the um, former chief executive. It was certainly before the uh, remuneration committee confirmed the extension of the notice period, which didn't happen until November 2018. Um, and I, I think it was ongoing engagement between the point where it became clear that the um, former ch chief executive would have to leave because her accountable officer status had been revoked, running up until the point of her departure in July 2018. And, and just before I explore that settlement agreement, the, the, to, uh, who would that local legal advice have been taken from? Is that internal to NHS Tayside? Is that Scottish Government? It was the Scottish Government Central Legal Office. Right. Um, so there was a settlement agreement concluded. Uh, uh, have you seen that settlement agreement, Auditor General? Again, Fiona will, yeah. Yes, we, we have a copy of that. Excellent. So, Fiona Mitchell-Knight, can you tell me, because I'm really not understanding the payment here, uh, and the source of my confusion is either that it was entirely a contractual payment in lieu of notice, payment in lieu of six months' notice, but I'm struggling with that because it doesn't appear to have been ratified until November, which would tend to suggest that it was still a three months notice period. Uh, but let's assume there was a valid contract variation, and I will come back and ask you about that in a second. Why would the, chief, the former chief executive agree to that? Because by going from a three months notice period to a six months notice period, she pays tax on the whole sum under the settlement agreement. Whereas if she says, I'll stick with my three months notice period and take a three months payoff, she doesn't pay tax on the three months payoff. So why would she have agreed to that? And secondly, if she has agreed to that, she's just signed a settlement agreement signing away 12 months unfair dismissal rights payment for nothing. Why would you do that? I think that's exactly the source of the confusion that we're trying to convey to the committee, Mr Kerr. Um, first of all, um, I think this, this was a negotiation um, rather than um, a payment simply in lieu of, of contractual notice. Um, secondly, the um, 
Assistant Chief Executive and Strategic Director of Workforce was concerned that the risks of a, an unfair dismissal claim um, were heightened if the former Chief Executive's notice period was um, lower than it ought to have been and lower than that of other Chief Executives of territorial boards across Scotland. We now know that both of those were not the case, but that was part of the rationale that was put forward. Um, and um, the reason why I concluded that the uh, decision to negotiate a settlement was reasonable was because there were risks that um, the CLO had assessed that an unfair dismissal claim could be successful, which could have cost the board more than the payment they came to. Now, none of that removes the fact that there was confusion in the, um, the negotiation and in the business case that was then submitted to government for approval. Yes, I understand. I, and I accept the point about the settlement that there is logic in complete logic behind concluding it in this manner. But that, Fiona Mitchell-Knight, can I press you on this? Have you seen the clause in the settlement agreement? Does that say that this is a six months notice payment or three months notice payment plus three months payoff? Um, I would need to refer to the settlement for the exact wording, but it does make specific reference to the notice period being six months. It, as part of the settlement right. and, and it says that the, all parties agree that the notice period is six months at that point in time. Uh, I have two very brief questions. Um, the, this decision seems to have been heavily, or the interim chief executive appears to have been heavily involved in this process. Uh, the interim chief executive uh, is moving on to take up a new position very shortly. I, I believe replacing Paul Gray at NHS Scotland. Uh, can I just confirm I'm correct on that? Um, my understanding is that Malcolm Wright has been appointed to act as Director General um, for Health and Sport in the Scottish Government um, from 1st of January, I think, for a period of 12 months. That's correct. Uh, and finally, on the board positions, I think you say in your report that uh, there have been changes on the board. There have been three changes. Could you just tell me a bit more detail about which positions have been changed out, please? Um, I, I report that I think three non-executive directors um, left the board during the year and have been replaced. Um, and then, um, more directly relevant to this, um, as you know, the uh, former director of finance left um, in the spring of last year and is now being uh, replaced on a permanent basis by the Director of Finance, who is covering both Grampian and Tayside. Malcolm Wright has been the interim chief executive from April until December of this year, and will then move on. And John Brown, the chair of Greater Glasgow and Clyde Health Board, has been the interim chair of NHS Tayside, I think, from April until uh, March 2019. And the government is in the process of replacing, um, of appointing a new chair to NHS Tayside at the moment. Um, you asked a question about um, Malcolm's involvement in this decision making and he was one of the people involved but one of a number of players. Um, he and the uh, interim chair of NHS Tayside were advised by the acting, uh, by the assistant chief executive and strategic, strategic director of workforce who was responsible for providing advice to them and there was also involvement in consultation with the Scottish Government's Central Legal Office and the Scottish Government's uh, Health Directorate for Workforce. Just for my absolute clarity, Auditor General, you, because you've talked a, a bit in this <coughs> session about the, the Assistant Chief Executive, uh, who is that Assistant Chief Executive and where are they now? Uh, the, the, I'll ask Fiona for the... Uh, Postholder's name in a moment. Um, she is the Assistant Chief Executive and Strategic Director of Workshop Workforce for NHS Tayside and is still in post. Um, and Fiona will be able to confirm her name for you. Yes, her name is Dr Annie Ingram. And she's also uh, Director of, of Workforce in Grampian, NHS Grampian. Thank you. Otter General, following on from Liam Kerr's questioning, um, and your report, does this throw up a bit of doubt on the quality of advice coming from the NHS Central Legal Office? Um, I would say not. I think that we're comfortable that the advice they provided to NHS Tayside was entirely reasonable um, on the basis of the information provided to them. How then could, could NHS Tayside have made such a mess of this in terms of the, 
the six month, three month notice period. Surely the lawyers should have picked that up and been quite quite strict with them in, in their advice that that was not the right thing to do, to, to double the payment. I think the, um, the, as my report says, the business case submitted to the Scottish Government for approval referred to a six month notice period. I think within the board there was a misunderstanding, first of all, that six months was standard, and secondly, that it could be, the notice period could be increased as part of the negotiation around the settlement without remuneration committee approval. That's incorrect, as I say in my report. Um, and I think that, that that element of it got lost within the wider negotiation about the uh, chief, the former chief executive's departure. Um, the, legal advice w w the legal advice was given on the basis of the six months, and that was a mistake made by NHS Tayside. I think that the mistake was um, the the formal status of the notice period and the connection between that and the six months uh, settlement that was finally agreed at the end of July. Should these uh, severance payments be taken right out of the hands of, of boards and dealt with at the highest level? I think it's, it's difficult um, to say that that would increase accountability. I think the um, new checks and balances that have been introduced relatively recently requiring them to be signed off by government are a useful safeguard. And it clearly does depend on people within NHS boards and other public bodies providing and seeking um, good HR and good legal advice to make that work properly. As I've said to the committee, I, I struggle to understand the confusion that arose here um, around uh, the extent to which the chief executive's notice period was in line with the guidance and different from um, that of other chief executives. Um, it's not been, the board wasn't able to provide us with evidence to support their view and it's not been difficult for us to identify the guidance and to find that other chief execs of territorial health boards do have a three month notice period. Liam Kerr. On that point, uh, the, so the point you make, Auditor General, is that the legal advice appears to have been sound, but there seems to have been a, a, a disconnect at the NHS Tay side end. Uh, there was an uh, erroneous pension payment, uh, so 19 odd thousand pension payment was made that it has now come to light shouldn't have been made. My understanding from paragraph 53 of your report is that the legal officers have said clawing that £19,000 back would breach the agreement. Uh, you then go on to say that the Assistant Chief Executive Stroke Strategic Director of Workforce, whom we were just talking about, uh, takes a different view uh, and is going to go ahead against the advice from the legal people saying this would be a breach of the agreement and the Assistant Chief Executive is going to seek repayment of the £19,000. Do you have any comment to make on that uh, and the uh, appropriateness of the Assistant Chief Executive looking to uh, go against the legal office's advice, apparently, once again? The um, £19,000 sum that you're referring to um, wasn't a payment made to the former Chief Executive, but um, a contribution made to the NHS pension scheme um, by NHS Tayside as covered by the settlement agreement which had been reached between the board and the former chief executive um, based on apparently a misunderstanding of the regulations that pension contributions relate to pensionable service rather than to payments and therefore a payment in lieu of notice doesn't attract and indeed can't attract pension contributions in that way. The advice of the central legal office, as I understand it, was that that contribution was part of the settlement agreement and that they for their can't, can't, therefore can't advise the board to reopen the settlement agreement and um, reclaim that payment to the NHS pension scheme. Um, the board's view is different, which is that it, because, it, because it doesn't represent pensionable service, the payment shouldn't have been made mm -hmm. to the board. The former chief executive doesn't benefit from the payment and therefore that it will be um, reconciled as part of their annual um, review of the uh, overall amount that should have been made to the pension scheme. I'm afraid I don't think I can clarify the matter very much more than that. It's clearly another element of confusion within this uh, decision. But just to be absolutely clear, the legal advice is clawing it back would be a breach of the agreement. The assistant chief executive takes a different view and will proceed based on her own view. Uh, that is a direct quote from my report and it's still our understanding of the position. 
I can't reconcile the two any more than you can. I've got Anas Sarwar first, and then I'll bring you in. If it's on that, then I'm happy. And, OK, Alec Neil. <coughs> two, two quick supplementaries. Number one, who actually authorised the 19000 into the pension fund? Was that the director of workforce? The um, settlement agreement um, was... Uh, <coughs> agreed between the board and uh, the Scottish Government, as it's required to be before it was signed. Um, but as I understand it, it was um, based on advice provided by the Assistant Chief Executive and um, going through a normal process of negotiation and presumably, as would take place in And presumably you'd have expected somebody in charge of HR to know the rules on pension contributions. But my second question is, um, in pursuing this, if this is going to be pursued legally, is the legal cost of trying to recover the 19,000 from the pension fund possibly going to exceed the, the 19,000 pounds? As I understand it, the board isn't proposing to pursue it legally. Their, their position is that the contribution should never have been made to the pension scheme, that the former chief executive doesn't benefit from it, and therefore they will recover it as part of the um, normal end year reconciliation, um, which makes, for, makes sure that the contributions made overall are at the right level for all of the staff covered for the year as a whole. Okay. Let me just clarify that we are going to receive a copy of the business case. Is that correct? Um, I, as I suggested, convener, I think, first of all, the committee may want to request it from NHS Tayside, but we're, we have a copy if that's an easy way for you and to receive it. And the settlement agreement as well. Thank you very much. Yes. And ask Sarwar. <coughs> or, I was going to ask some questions about performance, but before I do that, just um, we've covered before in previous sessions around the fact that we are um, governance and leadership heavy across the public sector, particularly in the NHS. So just, I'll repeat a question I've asked before. Um, you've mentioned around the chair of Greater Glasgow and Clyde being the interim chair in Tayside, someone who's doing a shared workforce role in Grampian and also in um, Tayside, the previous chief executive being a chief executive elsewhere and now moving on to be chief executive in NHS Scotland. Are there too many chiefs? I, I, you asked the question last time and my answer last time wasn't straightforward. Um, I, I think this is a really clear example of the fact that these are big, difficult jobs. The, the job of transforming NHS Tayside and making it clinically and financially sustainable for the future is a big job. Um, and when the committee was asking me questions about um, NHS Tayside at a session earlier this year, um, I expressed a concern that asking somebody to be covering both NHS Tayside and NHS, and NHS Grampian at that point um, for the Chief Executive, for the Finance Director and for the um, Workforce Director was a, a big ask. Um, so I think that um, we do need to make sure we have enough people of sufficient experience and calibre to do the job that we're requiring. And I think we make what is already uh, difficult to recruit and retain enough of those people across Scotland is made more difficult by adding in additional bodies mm. um, at different levels without considering the shape of the, the, the system as a whole. Um, so, so is that a polite way of saying there probably are too many big jobs and not enough people with sufficient abilities to do those jobs? I reported in my um, NHS overview report back in October that it's increasingly difficult to recruit and retain people <coughs> to do the jobs that are required. Um, and I think that that challenge is made more difficult by the fact that we now have not only 14 territorial health boards, but also um, 31 integration authorities, um, and that we are adding additional levels of planning in regional planning to uh, the NHS as well, while trying to integrate with social care. For me, it's the complexity of the system yep. which I think is the problem, rather than there being too many people doing the jobs. Thank you, Order General. And just specifically on, on performance, we've, we've covered before, the Chair covered the fact that there's um, 13 failing standards. Um, nine of the failing standards are below average, um, and five are worse than they were last year. Do you want to just comment again on the, on the patient impact side of the issues that are happening at NHS TSA. And I'll, I'll cover some of the specifics in a second. Uh, there's no doubt we all know that um, <coughs> the quality of care provided by the NHS is the most important thing that we're talking about here. Um, and um, although the national standards um, don't cover, in my view, the whole of the health and care system and therefore run the risk of giving us a partial view of what's going on, there's also no doubt that they cover things which are important to patients, waiting time in A&E, um, the time from referral to treatment. They're all things that matter to people and would to any of us and our families. So, so just a couple of specific examples. Um, the treatment time guarantee around 12 weeks 
<coughs> the target is 100%. Uh, the average is 75%. Last year, TSA was 81%. It's now at 71%. That doesn't sound like a board that's getting his act together. It sounds like the opposite. The 12 week out outpatient, exact same 95% standard, 75% Scottish average, 86% was Tayside's performance last year. It's now dropped to 71%. Again, doesn't feel like they're getting um, to grips with it. Cancer treatment, again, uh, below the standard, below the Scottish average, worse than last year. Save on psychological therapies. It's, it's getting worse from last year. It doesn't look like new governance, new structures is actually making a tangible difference to patient care in Tayside. My report is clear that um, the board has slipped from achieving nine of the national standards last year to seven this year. Um, and that, as you say, has an impact on patients. Um, it is against a backdrop of declining performance against the standards for the NHS as a whole in 2017-18. And I think it's, it's always been clear that the change that's required to improve performance across NHS Tayside and to put it on a more sustainable footing will take time. Um, that's very much the um, work which the plans that the interim leadership team have put in place is trying to achieve. My report says there's little evidence yet of an impact on these figures, mm. which is what you're highlighting. Um, we all hope that that will become evident in future, mm. and I think that really um, depends on more detail on the underpinning plans and effective and stable leadership to bring it about over a long period of time. I mean, the, the most stark statistic is we all know about the tragic high incidence rate of, of suicide in, in particular Dundee, but covering NHS Tayside. Um, we know of the Lost Souls of Dundee group, which is campaigning around um, trying to reduce the um, suicide rate in Dundee and to try and improve mental health services in Dundee. Um, we've already had in this parliament uh, a call for a, a review, which was passed by the parliament in terms of a, a review into mental health services uh, in NHS Tayside. So to look at the stats around psychological therapies and the CAM stats in particular, it's absolutely stark. I mean, the standard of 90% for CAMS performance, the Scottish average being 71%, Tayside's performance being relatively good a year ago, but in one year they've dropped. And over that, some of that period, whilst we've had this debate about mental health services in Dundee and in Tayside, it's dropped to 41%. So six out of 10 children aren't getting the referral to treatment in time in mental health services in Tayside. For psychological therapies in the round, 40%, over 40% aren't getting the referral to treatment in time when we also have the fact that that is the highest suicide rate area anywhere in Scotland, anywhere in the UK and perhaps anywhere in Europe. How, how can anyone justify that? Forget the severance payments for a second. Forget the governance issues for a second. How can anyone in any kind of leadership position at any level in Tayside or across the NHS in Scotland justify that performance? I've been reporting to this committee over a number of years about the challenges facing NHS Tayside precisely because of um, my concern, the concern of my colleagues, that what the board is there to do is to provide health services to the people of Tayside and its financial position is making that more and more difficult to achieve. I have no doubt about that. Um, we have reported in today's report some of the action that's underway to try to turn that around and said that so far there's little evidence that it's having an impact. We'll continue to monitor it. Um, and the NHS as a whole is under pressure. Now, I'm, my, my job is to bring the, these facts to the attention mm. of the committee with as much context as we can, and we'll continue to do it. Um, I think there is an important point now about giving the leadership team uh, time to uh, bring forward and to implement the plans they have for making change. And the committee will be interested in what assurance you can take that that's happening from us, from the Assurance Advisory Group, from government, I yep. think. There's one uh, particular point I should uh, get clarify just for the record. The committee will recall that we briefed you quite recently on our report on child and adolescent mental health services. And I think in relation to that particular standard, there was a, an issue around the um, changes to services and the way in which information was recorded, mm. which had an effect on performance over and above the pressures on the service itself. That's not to say there are yeah. no pressures, but I think there is a, a factor that relates to that fall from 96% um, to 41% in a single year, which is not only about the service. But, but it's factually correct to say that since the implementation of the new leadership team, performance on the standards has declined? 
That's not quite true, just for, to be absolutely clear. The performance here is performance as, as at the 31st of March 2018, right, okay. and the new leadership team came in in April 2018 on an interim basis. OK, and the quarterly figures that are published are showing an improvement or a reduction? Uh, I don't know if we can answer that for you just at this moment. No, we can come back to you, but I can't answer it to you. Uh, uh, and final question, yet. in terms of performance, do you put down the performance to it being primarily a leadership governance issue, primarily being a financial issue in terms of financial pressures, or primarily a, a workforce issue in terms of gaps in the workforce, or is, as is most likely the case, a balance between all three of those? But, but where does those, if it is all three, wh where is the, where is the, the biggest challenge in, in terms of order of priorities? I think you're right, it is a balance of all three, and I'll ask Lee to tell you a little bit more about what we know about the board's performance and the pressures on it. Um, again, just to repeat, uh, I guess what the Auditor General was saying is that we recently reported that we see declining performance across many boards in Scotland, so Tayside is not alone in their declining performance. Um, and I think it is a mixture of all three, you know, the, the financial pressures. And again, we, we say this in our recent NHS in Scotland report, workforce issues, rising demand. Um, I think the thing that we should point out about Tayside, though, is although some of the standards have declined, I think in several areas, I'm just like nine, um, they actually do better than the Scottish average and in some very key areas. So, for example, in accident and emergency waiting times, antenatal care, um, ho hospital associated infections, infections um, and you you pointed out the cancer waiting times as one of the I think it's the 31 days um, they they are below average but actually in the uh, 62 days I think they're above average um, where across Scotland we there are some of the key areas where we see decline um, in performance in other areas uh, one final question chair sorry it's you said I think in the report that they require brokerage again do you expect that to be signed off again or written off again? I mean, the the fact that they don't have to be in budget, or any health board doesn't have to be in budget in a single year, but have to be over a three-year period, surely that brings challenges. And if we're accepting that Tayside would require brokerage again, is the incompetence of Tayside being, being given too much favourability at the expense of patients and, and other health boards across Scotland? There's a lot in that question, so I'll take it step by step and, and perhaps ask colleagues to pick up anything I miss. First of all, the board's current financial position. Um, the financial plan for 1819 that was agreed in June by the interim leadership team um, forecast a potential deficit of £18.7 million this year, um, to which needs to be added the um, £3.6 million um, required to repay the endowment fund funds money going back to 2014-15. Um, and the board's latest financial projection, which was reported to the board uh, last Thursday, um, suggests that they are £3.8 million behind the £18.7 million. So all of that together, the current forecast is a deficit of just over £26 million for 2018-19. We understand that the board will require brokerage um, from the government to cover, to cover that. Um, I don't know what discussions are going on between the board and the government about the difference between the originally um, planned position and the latest forecast, um, but that, those discussions, I'm sure, will be underway. In relation to the um, write-off of brokerage, the commitment made by the Cabinet Secretary was that territorial boards would have all of the outstanding brokerage, as at the 31st of March next year, written off. Um, and um, I assume that will be the case, subject to any discussions about this year's brokerage requirement. We don't yet know in any detail how the commitment about... Um, <coughs> breaking even over a three-year period will work in practice or indeed whether it will apply to all health boards. We're waiting for more detail on that and it will obviously have an impact on NHS Tayside's financial position after the current financial year, uh, which is another one of the uncertainties um, that um, decided me in bringing this report to the committee today. Uh, and sorry, final, final question. That's your third final and question, I'm sorry. Mr. Is, do, do you think there's a risk that health boards will say we're going to get it written off anyway. We're going to get brokerage, we're going to get it written off anyway. And we're now creating a pattern of rewarding bad behaviour, which gives us longer term financial challenges for NHS Scotland. I, I think um, 
Yeah. That the, is my final question. Chef, thank sorry. you. <coughs> I, I think the existence of brokerage and the reliance on it of some boards over the years that I've been in this job is something I've been raising as a concern with this committee. I think it... Um, it focuses people on the year-end financial performance to the exclusion of wider clinical and financial sustainability. Um, and I think it does raise a risk that those boards who have poorer financial management um, benefit at the expense of those who take a longer-term, more strategic view. If anything, I think the commitment to move to a three-year um, cycle, depending on the details of that, will improve that position, not worsen it. Um, and we're watching quite carefully what's happening in health boards across Scotland this year as we're heading up to the 31st March 2019 point at which the Cabinet Secretary has said all outstanding brokerage for territorial boards will be written off. We don't yet know what that will look like, but we're watching it closely. Thank you. Thank you. Willie Coffey. Convener, I mean, one of the... The purposes of the, the audit committee is to try to identify where performance is improving. It's not all just gloom and doom and giving health boards or whoever a kick in when performance is bad, but there is, when there is any examples of good performance, we should highlight it. And the, the performance table in your report, Auditor General, seems to show that for NHST side. And Lee Johnston, you mentioned a few examples. Depending on how you read it, there's, a, there's five or seven indicators where NHS T-side are actually performing above target or above the Scottish average, whether it be in four-hour A&E response time, where they've always had a good reputation, as I understand it. They've always been pretty pretty good, uh, whether it's in antenatal care or C. diff treatment or IVF waiting times or 48-hour access to GB practice. So what... what could explain the contrast in good performance over a range of areas and then not so good or deteriorating performance in some of these other areas that have been mentioned? We always try to be fair and balanced in our reporting, as the committee would expect. Um, and as Lee has said, um, NHS Tayside has, um, over the last few years, tended to perform in general against these standards above the Scottish average. Um, I suspect that's related um, to some degree to its more expensive operating model. Um, it does have higher staffing costs than other NHS boards for delivering similar services. Um, its prescribing costs are higher. Um, I think its estate costs are higher. Now, none of those are directly related necessarily to higher standards of performance, um, but you can see a picture where those two could hang together. My understanding is that the um, interim leadership team has done a lot of work to really understand um, the way in which uh, health services in Tayside are planned and provided and the relationship with costs. It's now turning that into detailed action plans for making change, which seems to me to be a priority. Mm. The, the assurance and advisory group report that was mentioned at the start of the meeting, minute, it did come late, but it's not alone in papers that come late to this committee or other committees, so it's perhaps a bit unfair to single that out. We always get late material, but I wonder, Auditor General, if you had a chance to, to look at the... I didn't say we always get late material. I said it's not the first time it's happened. No, it's happened three I'm, or four I'm, times. I'm Please saying continue. we always get late material from a wide range of sources, convener. Uh, experience that at this committee and other committees and there's no set rule about when deadlines are for papers to appear for committees, they just seem to appear and we take them and this one's no different but having, having had a look at it in the two areas that you mentioned in your own report, Auditor General, in relation to workforce costs and prescribing costs they are high and you've said that in your report but in the advisory group report which we did get last night there seems to be progress being made in these two areas. In relation to workforce, the, that report says that there's a marked improvement in agency nursing costs falling about 33% compared to the same period last year. And the figures for medical locums have also improved, showing an 11% decrease against that quarter. So there seems to be some progress in the workforce costs. And have you had a chance to have a look at the report yourself? Or will you come back to us at a future yeah. committee to assess this progress? 
I'm afraid I haven't had a chance to look at it. I think it was sent to the committee at six o'clock yesterday evening. It was copied to Audit Scotland, but unfortunately it was copied to our general business support um, email inbox um, and wasn't identified until um, our admin staff started work at 8.30 this morning. Um, so I haven't had a chance to look at it at all. I'm pleased to hear there's progress. Um, and um, I don't think that changes my view that at the time my report was prepared, there was little evidence of the sort of sustainable change that's needed. But, uh, I mean, I, I did have some time to, to look at it, convener, and in the prescribing area, which has been highlighted, has been ex excessively overspent in the past. There's also some moderate progress there too, and this report shows that to the end of March 18 showed that a delivery of £2.7 million pounds in efficiency savings from primary care prescribing. They do say that's a modest, a modest amount though, compared to the target of three and a half million, but it is showing, hopefully, for members a trajectory of good performance and getting to grips with two of the key overspend areas that the board have been facing. As you'd expect, we'll be looking at it closely now that we've received it um, and we'll be triangulating it with what uh, Fiona and Bruce are seeing as part of their audit work during the year and it will be a key part of our reporting back to the committee next year. OK. Thank you very much. Bill Bowman. Thank you, Convener. Just a couple of areas. Firstly, could I ask, going back to the Chief Executive's um, mm -hmm. payment in lieu of notice, when did the Auditor General or Audit Scotland become aware of this as an issue? Did they bring it to you or did you find it? Um, the, the committee will recall that um, we gave evidence to you about the position in relation to 1516 um, earlier this year, um, and it, events then moved on to the point where um, the former chief executive's accountable officer status was removed and negotiations opened. Um, at that stage, um, we were aware of the negotiations, and um, Fiona and her team were uh, keeping close to it. Um, they then did the detailed audit work to look at um, the uh, process and the factors that were taken into account. And I can ask you to talk a bit more about the timing of that, Fiona. Yes, immediately we, we became aware that, that the Chief Executive had, had formally departed from the Board. We uh, contacted uh, the Assistant Chief Executive um, Director of Finance um, and explained that we would be carrying out the audit work and requested a range of information which included the business case, the, the settlement agreement um, and, and a whole range, range of information which fed into um, our conclusions there. As part of the audit, we, we met with the Assistant Chief Executive the Director of Finance, um, the um, Interim Chief Executive and the Chairman. And we also um, spoke to Scottish Government um, representative who signed off the business case and we spoke to the Central Legal Office also as part of the audit evidence. So when exactly would you say you found that as an issue? So that was between... Um, so it, it, we more or less concluded our work... Um, by the end of November, so it was ongoing. Um, it was quite a lengthy process just because we needed to speak to so many people um, as part of that to make sure So there sure was no we way you could have influenced the actual outcome of the Oh, no, no, it was already... The agreement was already reached and, and the Chief Executive had already departed um, before we became right. aware of that, yeah. So then, then, just moving on slightly, you said that three, I think, non-executives had left and they were from the Audit Committee. Is the audit committee now fully staffed, if you like, um, with appropriately qualified individuals? And when you discussed this issue with them about the um, payment of um, the lieu of notice, how did they excuse themselves in, in relation to that? Um, Bruce, could you... Do we know, is the audit committee fully... I uh, fully yes, I think, fully. yes. Uh, the audit committee does have a full complement of, of non-executive directors. Um, we can't really comment on on uh, how effectively uh, that audit uh, that committee is uh, is operating at the, at the moment because it's too early days with those those new executives. That's something we will uh, look at through throughout our audit. We didn't discuss the findings of the chief executive's departure with the audit committee. Um, it's very clear in the Scottish government guidance that the 
ultimate responsibility for a settlement agreement lies with the accountable officer, so that's the chief executive, and we did speak to him as part of this. But as we've already um, discussed earlier, there was a role for the remuneration committee in all of this, that once the notice period was increased, but the remuneration committee was only asked to discuss it in, in November as a result of the findings of our audit. I would find that slightly unusual. The audit committee, you wouldn't discuss an issue like this with them? Well, after we would rep have reported the issues, we would take them to the audit committee for discussion. But this is the first time this has been reported because our annual audit report was issued at the end of June as part of the, the sign-off of, of the accounts. And this obviously only came to, to light after the chief executive's uh, departure. So we did our work in August and this is the first time this has been reported publicly. We will now expect the findings to be presented to the audit committee and, and we will be involved in those discussions. What would you expect that they might do with this information? Um, I would expect that they they would um, apply an appropriate range of scrutiny and ask uh, questions of um, the appointed officer, uh, the accountable officer in in the board um, on on the issues that are reported. Just here. one final point on that: Would you have expected the um, the chief executive to raised this with the audit committee when an issue like this came up? I think um, Fiona um, mentioned but hasn't stressed that the errors in this were identified by her and her audit team mm -hmm. um, in reviewing what had happened after the sign-off of the accounts at the end of June mm -hmm. um, leading up to <coughs> the uh, former chief executive's departure at the end of July. Um, the, it will be discussed with the audit committee um, as part of the closure of the 1819 audit accounts, I think it does raise um, questions about the um, the way in which advice was provided, and the extent to which um, the overall uh, controls were operating effectively in the board during this period. I'm not sure that's entirely lost your answered your question. So I, I think it says it. there's some sort of gap in the governance here. Bruce, thank you. Thank you. Um, I think the Audit Committee is receiving the statute, uh, Section 22 report for consideration today, so I would imagine there would be quite a bit of scrutiny around this at the, at the meeting today. Okay. It's probably an uncomfortable meeting. Thank you. Just following on from Bill Bowman's question, the Remuneration Committee were asked to approve retrospectively just last month the change from three months to six months. Bill Bowman asked about the audit committee and if the new members of the board are on the audit committee, is the remuneration committee a, a subcommittee of the audit committee? I think what I'm asking is, is it the same new personnel that were asked to approve this retrospective payment the or retrospective contractual change? The remuneration committee of any board is a, a separate committee in its own right. It's not a subcommittee of the audit committee. I'm not sure whether we can answer about the overlap of membership between the two now, but we can certainly provide that to this committee after the meeting. Could you provide that information? The, the point I'm trying to drive at is we're concerned about governance. And if we find ourselves with, with new members of the board who were asked then in November to, to approve this contractual uh, arrangement retrospectively, then I think that would indicate a problem as well. So it would be good to have that membership of the Audit Committee and the Remuneration Committee just for clarity, if you can provide that. Do members have any further questions for Audit Scotland on this NHS Tayside report this morning? No. Okay. Can I thank you very much indeed for your evidence? I now close the, the public session as we move into private.